Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath and Happy New Year. Happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath and Happy New, New Year. Year. So uh, we want to welcome you to our last Sabbath School of the Year, and it couldn't be in a more appropriate topic. It's all things new, and that's what we want for our new year, isn't it? All things new. We make our, our New Year's resolutions and we move forward. So before we start, Greg, would you pray for us, please? It would be my pleasure. Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this. To have this lesson broadcast. We ask and pray also for your Holy Spirit to be with us, to guide us and direct us. And may the words that come out of our mouth be the words from you through your Holy Spirit on wanting and listening ears. We pray and ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So our memory verse comes from Revelation 21.5. Then he who sat on the throne, behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write these words are true and faithful. And that's what we're looking forward to, isn't it? Is all things new. In our last lesson, we dealt with the Christian's ultimate hope and longing for the time God will establish the eschatological new heaven and earth. All the old order of the sinful world will pass away. Satan will not be around to harass or deceive us. Our past sins no longer trouble us. And our failings, sins, and trespasses will be blotted out. All distresses, disappointments, and wounds will be healed. After the millennium, God will wipe away our tears, and the great controversy will be finished. God will create everything new. In this landscape, love, happiness, peace, joy will rule. God will establish the new heavens and new earth with a new quality of life. There will be no more need for hospitals, prisons, cemeteries, because no pain, suffering, violence, crime, exploitation, or death will be present. So let's take a look at Revelation 21, 4 and 5. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said, Write these words are true and faithful. New Jerusalem will be the dwelling place of God with man. And that's the exciting part. The new Jerusalem for God. That's God's plan for us. He will dwell with us and we will be his people. And God himself will be with us as our God. Revelation 21, 3 says, And I heard the voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. So life in the new heaven and earth will be breaking, breathtaking, and most satisfying. God has revealed to us about it, and it's beyond anything that we can imagine or even, even fathom. The throne of God, the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will be worshiping him. They will see his face, his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no lamp for light or sun, for God will be their light, and, he, and they will reign forever and ever. Revelation 22, 3 through 5 said, There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no more night, no, no lamp or light for the sun, for God gives us light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So scripture gives us hope, but according to his promise, we're looking for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. For some, however, the promise of a new heaven and new earth which we see in Revelation 21, seems like a fantasy. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. 
And I've always wondered about this comment, no more sea, because I love the sea. I love to go, I love to go sit in the ocean. I love to sail. So I'm going, no more sea. And Ellen White talks about this in Heaven on page 138. She says, the sea divides friends. It is a barrier between us and those whom we love. Our associations are broken up by a broad, fathomless ocean. In the new earth, there will be no more sea, and there will be there will, shall pass no galleys with oars. In the past, many who loved and served God have been bound by chains to their seats in the galleys, compelled to serve the purpose of cruel, hard-hearted men. The Lord looked upon their suffering in sympathy and compassion. Thank God, the new earth, that, that the earth made new. There will be no fierce torrents, no engulfing ocean, no restless or murmuring waves. And John felt that too when he said on Isle of Patmos because that was, that was ugly. So, and through some people have used the future hope presented in the Bible that way they don't abuse, change the truth of promise that we have regarded of the new heavens and new earth. In the last day, scoffers will ridicule our blessed hope. 2 Peter 3, 3 through 7 says, knowing first that scoffers will come in the last days, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were, were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which now are preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of the ungodly. But the, their scoffing, just as predicted, could be seen more as evidence that the Bible is true. And this comes from great controversy. For they would... They are scoffing as the Bible predicted they would. Thus, it is shown that Scripture gives no warrant for men to remain in ignorance concerning the nearness of Christ's coming, but those who desire only an excuse to reject the truth close their ears to explanation and words. No man knoweth did day or the hour continue to be echoed by bold scoffers and even by professed ministers of Christ. And the people were aroused and began to inquire about the way of salvation. She's actually talking about here is what was happening in 1844. Religious teachers stepped in between them, the truth seeking to quiet their fears by falsely interpreting the word of God. Unfaithful watchmen united in the work of the great deceiver, crying peace, peace, when God had not spoken peace. Like the Pharisees, in Christ's day, many refused to enter the kingdom of heaven themselves, and those who were entering in, they hindered. The blood of these souls will be required at their hand. During this week, we will reflect on the glorious promise of a new heaven and a new earth, including the heavenly temple and the presence of God at the end of death and tears and final triumph in God's love. And this is so exciting because when you read Revelation, uh, 21 and, and 22, it's just gives you goosebumps to think how exciting it's going to be. Amen. So, Mary, you want to talk about a new heaven and a new earth? Yes. Good morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. Let me ask you guys, how many times do you think the phrase or the concept of a new heaven and new earth is found in the Bible? We'll see how many you guys get. Oh, you how many times? Just guess. How many times? Oh, the concept lot. of new heaven, that phrase, new heaven, new earth. I would, 20. I would say at least 100 <laughs> okay. or more. Actually, I should have said just that phrase, maybe new heaven and a new earth. It's actually four times. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. But it does talk about a lot about <laughs> heaven and earth, but I'm sorry, I maybe was a little well, misleading we were on that. Today, yes. <laughs> there <you go. laughs> so there are four times in scripture 
It's found in Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, 2 Peter, and in Revelation. So let's delve into Isaiah, Peter, and what John have said about the new heaven and the new earth. And we're going to begin by reading Isaiah 65, and it's verses 17 to 25. I'll read it and I'll make some comments as we read through the passage. So verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. God is intervening here, and he creates because he is the creator. Former shall not be remembered because God's new creation will be so marvelous that our former experiences in life will no longer burden us. He continues in verse 18, But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create, for behold, I create Jerusalem as a rejoicing and her people a joy. Verse 19, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. So God reiterates the fact that he will create and his people and his city, Jerusalem, will be rejoicing and have joy and God himself will be rejoicing and have joy. And then he continues, the voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Why? In verse 20, it says, No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die 100 years old, but the sinner, being 100 years old, shall be accursed. There will be no crying due to the fact there's no infant mortality or premature death. There will only be longevity of life. Verse 21 and 22 continue. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. God's people will be building and planting and eating involved in creative activity and enjoying all of it peace and prosperity will be secured verse 23 they shall not labor in vain nor bring forth children for trouble for they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the lord and their offspring with them so we will enjoy life under god's presence and blessing verse 24 it shall come to pass that before they call i will answer and while they are still speaking, I will hear. Prayers will be immediately answered because of open communion with God. And then verse 25 ends. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. And this Isaiah is quoting from something that he wrote in chapter 11, where the Holy Spirit inspired him regarding um, Jesus reigning as the rod and root of Jesse's offspring. So he's quoting from there, including, and dust shall be the serpent's food. So there are new conditions of life and new relations even in the animal world. And lastly, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. So God states emphatically that there will be no hurting or destruction in his new creation. Now let's continue reading the next chapter of Isaiah. That's 66, verses 22 and 23. For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord. So here God again is reiterating that he is the creator. And in his new creation, there's no change or destruction. It stands firm forever. And he continues, so shall your descendants and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. So we will worship our God in this new heavens and new earth from month to month. That's what new moon to new moon means. And from week to week, that's Sabbath to Sabbath. Now we'll review the third reference in the scriptures to a new heaven and new earth, which is found in 2 Peter 3.13. And I'll read from verse 10 so that we have the whole context of this verse. 
um, well understood and well planted. So verse 10 begins, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So this is regarding Christ's second coming in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. So he restates that the earth and its current status will be totally destroyed. Continues verse 11, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. So here he's stating with strong terminology, the utter destruction to befall the earth. Can anything good come from this complete annihilation? Well, next he makes a dramatic statement. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So Peter points us beyond the complete eradication of this earth to a brand new condition of our planet and includes an additional detail that righteousness dwells in it. There is no iniquity. So our fourth and last reference to a new heavens and a new earth is in Revelation 21, verses 1 to 5. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So here we see there will be a new city placed on a new earth. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will wipe away every tear from their eye. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. What a beautiful passage and promise God has left for us. The new heavens and earth will be God's unique tangible creation. There will be no sinless past to burden us. It will be a place of joy and happiness, no death, sorrow, pain, weeping, or crying. We will be happily building and planting, creating and enjoying the fruits of our labor. New conditions in nature will be seen in the interaction of animals with each other and with mankind. Peace and prosperity will be secured. God will be living with us. His righteousness will dwell there. We will be in his presence, enjoying his blessings, having direct communion with him. We'll worship him on a weekly and a monthly basis. He will make all things new. In other words, a complete restoration to this planet and humanity. Praise God for that new heavens and new earth. Amen. Thank you. So, Greg, tell us what it's going to be like in the temple of God. Well, good morning, everyone, again. And it's going to be a pleasure to go through this. Monday's lesson is titled, In the Temple of God. And today's lesson really focuses on two different descriptions of God's temple in the book of Revelation. And the first description we'll look at is from Revelation chapter 7. The second description we'll look at is from Revelation 21. And so we'll need to reconcile these two descriptions because I think some people have a question in their minds that they haven't really thoroughly studied the book of Revelation. So let's go ahead and dig right into the lesson. The temple of God as described in Revelation chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 9 through 10 and then 13 through 15. So let's read those together. After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to you, our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. 
and then verses 13 through 15. Then one of the elders said to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell with them. So which temple is John describing here? Well, John is, he's showing the temple in heaven after the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting because according to the Greek lexicon, this temple, and the word is neos, is used in the, ver- in the visions of Revelation used to describe the temple of the New Jerusalem. So you're going to hear that term, the New Jerusalem, which is in Scripture, and you're going to hear it throughout this lesson here. And this temple of the New Jerusalem in heaven, and this word neos is also appears in multiple other verses in Revelation, including Revelation 3, 12, 11, 9, 14, 15, there's about four or five more. So not only does this word nehos is being used as referring to a temple or shrine, but can also be used metaphorically as the spiritual temple consisting of the saints of all ages joined together by and in Christ. So I think that's very interesting that that specific term of uh, of temple is used here. And who is there? Who is in this heavenly temple? Well, Scripture tells us all the angels, the 24 elders, and the four living creatures, plus a great multitude that no one can number from all nation, tribes, tongues, and people. And they are arrayed in white robes. And those who come out of the great tribulation. And then verse 15 tells us that they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night in his temple. So John is describing the temple of God in the holy city, the New Jerusalem, which is in heaven after the second coming of Jesus and during the 1,000 years we reign with God in heaven. And again, this is before the New Jerusalem descends down to earth from heaven. And I like what Ellen White has to say here on this, just to, to give extra clarity on this. And she states, and this is in Great Controversy, page 645, On each side of the cloudy chariots, and this is on the way to heaven, on each side of the cloudy chariots are wings, and beneath it are living wheels. And as the chariot rolls upward, the wheels cry holy, and the wings as they move cry holy, and the retinue of angels cry holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And the redeemed shout, Alleluia, as the chariot moves onward toward the new Jerusalem. So be very clear what John is describing is the new Jerusalem in heaven. And now let's take a look at Revelation chapter 21. And we'll look at a few verses here. We'll start with verses 1 through 3, then 9 through 10, and 22 through 23. And so let's go ahead and read these now. Now I saw in a new heaven, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. Also there was no more sea. We heard this earlier. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And this word tabernacle in the Greek is Skene, and skene means habitation. And the Greek lexicon goes on to explain what this verse says, um, not exclusively, but in particular, it, it explains what this is referring to. And it's a reference t- to uh, the fact that it is declared when the kingdom of God is perfectly established. So when you have the new Jerusalem coming down to earth, God's kingdom has been perfectly established. Established. Let's continue with verses 9 through 10 and then 22 through 23. Then one of the seven angels who had seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came and, and, uh, to me and talked with me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. But I saw no temple in it. 
For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. So how is this description different than the first description in Revelation 7? Well, I think you can tell the verses 9 through 10 are telling us that this bride, the Lamb's wife, his kingdom is the new Jerusalem that is in heaven, but it's descending from heaven. So now it's coming down to earth here. And in verse 22, John tells us that he did not see a temple because our Lord, our Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And of course, in verse 23, as we just read, the city has no need of the sun or of the moon for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. So here we have two different descriptions of the new Jerusalem. That's all it is. Two different descriptions. One in heaven and then one, that same one from heaven descending down to the earth. So that's how we reconcile them. It's just understanding the description of when they take place. So based on what scripture tells us, the new Jerusalem that descends from heaven to earth, John didn't see a temple, right? That's what he stated. But let me ask you this, will there be a throne? Well, Let's see what God has to say in Revelation chapter 22, 1 through 5. Mary just read that, but sometimes it helps to repeat and enlarge because we're talking about two different concepts and we'll pick out different things here. So Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations, and there shall be no more curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. So we know there's going to be a throne in the new Jerusalem on the earth. And his servants shall serve him. And as we have read already, they, they shall see his face and his name shall be written on their foreheads. We're going to talk more about this in Thursday's lesson. But I just want to make sure that what we understand is that these two descriptions are harmonious. It's just a description of the first temple, the new Jerusalem in heaven, when we are redeemed and we go to heaven and we're there with Christ for a thousand years. And then the second description is that same new Jerusalem coming down to heaven. So I think just the fact that we're going to be able to see his face and have our names written on our foreheads. As the hymn says, what a day of rejoicing that'll be. That's Amen. It. Very good, thank you. So we're going to talk about next in the presence of God. Have you ever thought about what your first reaction will be standing in God's presence? I feel like that uh, the, the trip to heaven is going to be overwhelming in itself. But to see God face to face for the first time will be just a plethora of emotions. I can see tears. I can see smiles. I can see falling on our faces. I can see jumping for joy. It's just, just so many emotions to be able to really stand in, in God's presence. And it's interesting because from the very beginning, and Adam and Eve ha had the privilege of, of seeing God face to face, and, and so did the disciples at, at the time of his coming. But throughout the Bible, we see in both the Old and the New Testament, people having the desire to see God. And an example of this we see in Exodus 33, 18 to 23, which was that of Moses. And Moses said to, said, God, please show me your glory in, in Exodus 18. And in 19 said, I will make my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But he said, 
you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place for me, and you shall stand on the rock. And it shall be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face will not be seen. And we see this because God's glory is so bright that man can't live in its presence. Then we see in the New Testament, we see uh, Philip uh, saying in John 14, 8 and 9, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I not been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? So we see that throughout the Old and New Testament, man wanted to to see Jesus and and God face to face. But the the Bible says that God dwells in an unapproachable light. 1 Timothy 6.16 says, Who alone has immortality dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. We know that no one has seen God. John 1.18 says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So we see God through Jesus. John, 1 John 4, 12 says, No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. Does it seem that the saints of heaven will never see God, the Father? <laughs> no, not at all. It's quite evident that not seeing God refers to human beings after their fall into sin, and <clears throat> that the scripture clearly tells us that the saints will actually see him in heaven. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. First John 3, 2 and 3 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and yet has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has that hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. And so we, we know that when Christ comes, that we, he will put on us incorruptible bodies, and so we will be able to see him face to face. Revelation 22 3 and 4 says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb of God shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be written on their foreheads. So once we're in heaven, we will see God face to face. And within our foreheads, we will know that we are his children. The same Apostle John who states that no one has ever seen God, also declares we shall see him as he is, and we shall see his face. Revelation 22, 3 and 4 says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb of God shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And so it's very exciting, again, that we see this. It can be debatable whether these passages refer to God the Father or to Christ. But all doubts are gone in light of Christ's own statement. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So there's no doubt that we will be able to see God in heaven as well. So what a privilege it will be for the redeemed to worship in his temple. But the supreme privilege is is to see him face to face. That'll be so much fun to sit down at Christ's feet and to talk to him, to learn from him. We get excited, you know, studying our lessons and and learning about God, but he will be able to explain things in ways that we, we could never imagine. 
The people of God are privileged to hold open communion with the Father and the Son. We see this in 1 Corinthians uh, 3.12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. No, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. So we will be able to, <clears throat> to have that communion. And if we don't understand something, he's able to explain it to us. The great controversy says, we behold the image of God reflected as in a mirror in the works of nature and his dealings with men. But when we shall see him face to face without a dimming veil between, we shall stand in his presence and behold the glory of his countenance. <clears throat> so we notice that some of the verses for today link between purity of seeing God and pure in heart. The, so it, we talk about the, the blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We see that in Matthew 5, 8. And 1 John 3, 3 says, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. So what these verses tell us is that God must do a work in us now to prepare us for heaven. All through the, these lessons that we've, we've, we've studied about death and about the judgment. The goal for us is not to be living on this earth, but preparing for heaven by preparing our hearts for God. Though in the end, our title to heaven has been made uh, certain through the death of Jesus, we will go through a purifying process here and now that will help prepare us for our eternal home. And central to the purification process is obedience to his word. First Peter says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass and all glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away. But the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel is preached to you. So I'm looking forward to that day and I'm excited and, and prayerfully hope that God keeps working that purity in me. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So uh, Mary, you were going to talk about no more death. That's no right. More tears. In the new heavens and new earth, there is no more death and tears. So the theory of an immortal soul suffering <clears throat> forever in an ever-burning hell contradicts the biblical teaching that in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. That's in Revelation 21.4. If this theory were true, then the second death would not eradicate sin and sinners from the universe, but only confine them to an everlasting hell of sorrow and crying. In addition, the universe would never be fully restored to its original perfection. But praise the Lord that God's word paints an entirely different picture. We're going to go back to Isaiah, and let's read Isaiah 25. In this chapter, Isaiah, the prophet of hope, praises God for his judgments and points to the establishment of his kingdom. Like what Greg had covered earlier, Christ is going to be establishing his kingdom. And here in Isaiah 25, verse 8, we read, He, that's Christ, will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. The rebuke of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. So Isaiah is clearly stating that death will never rear its ugly head again throughout eternity. And the tears that we now shed because of death and separation God will wipe away from all faces. and Praise God for that. Now let's read what John wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in Revelation chapter 7, 
17. But I'm going to read starting from chapter 14, uh, excuse me, verse 14, so that we get a context. And here, John sees this great multitude clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, standing before the throne of God. So this scene is in heaven. It's after Jesus is coming. When he takes us to the Father at the beginning of the millennium, and one of the 24 elders asks John, who are these people that you're seeing, John? And John responds and says to him in verse 14, sir, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne, that's Jesus, will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So here the elder who is speaking to John, he repeats what Isaiah had written earlier under the Holy Spirit's inspiration. So now let's go towards the end of Revelation and read again verse 21.4. And let's take note that this is within the context of the New Jerusalem. And when did John see the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven? It was after death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. In chapter 20, it talks about that. But John, in chapter 21, after that, he sees the new Jerusalem coming down. So in chapter 20, verse 14, it says that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. So the lake of fire has consumed death and hell, and now John sees a new heaven and a new earth. And in chapter 21, 4, continues, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. What comfort and hope can these passages bring to us during the trials and sufferings in this present sinful world. We may have gone through some extremely difficult, heartbreaking, heart-wrenching experiences in this life, and more may come, but we can take heart and gain strength in God by knowing that one glorious day in the near future, he will take away all motives for death, sorrow, pain, and crying, and all these will cease to exist. We can trust that in the final judgment, God will treat every single human being with fairness and love. All our loved ones who died in Christ will be raised from the dead to be with us throughout eternity. Those on the other hand, who have rejected God and his gift of eternal life will finally cease to exist without having to live in an unpleasant heaven or in an ever-burning hell. Our greatest comfort derives from the fair way God treats everyone. Paul described what it will be like when death finally ceases to exist. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, the redeemed will shout joyfully, O oh, oh death, where is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The Lord promised that in the new heaven and the new earth that he is going to create, the former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. That's in Isaiah 65, 17 that I read earlier. And this doesn't mean that heaven is a place of amnesia but rather that the past will not undermine the enduring joy of heaven. Paul quoted Isaiah 64.4 when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 2.9, 
But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. No finite mind can comprehend the glory of the paradise of God. We'll be so overwhelmed by God and heaven that we won't bother to take time to tell of our trials and difficulties as we're surrounded by God's glory. May his precious promises of no more death and tears give us strength and comfort in our most trying experiences here while we wait Jesus' second coming. And I'd like to end with a quote from Ellen White with a devotional from the heart, and it says, In the darkest days of her long conflict with evil, the church of the living God has been given revelations of the eternal purposes of Jehovah. His people have been permitted to look beyond the trials of the present to the triumphs of the future. When the warfare, having been accomplished, the redeemed will enter into possession of the promised land. These visions of future glory, scenes pictured by the hand of God, should be dear to his church today when the controversy of the ages is rapidly closing and the promised blessings are soon to be realized in all their fullness. Praise God. Wow. Thank you. So, Greg, you're going to explain about the, about the his name in their forehead. Yes. I'd rather say our forehead. Yes. Amen. And we will read it, but understanding that it, we're claiming that, that his name will be written in our forehead. Yes. And given that this, um, this is the last lesson of the quarter for 2022. So I think it's, it's an important lesson. I know the Lord blessed me in preparing for this, and I hope this blesses you. But Thursday's lesson, again, it's t entitled, His Name on Their Foreheads. And so what does this mean? What does that actually mean? Because if you said that to someone, God's name will be written on your forehead. They would say, okay, fine. What does that mean? Well, let's get into this. Let's look at Revelation 22, verses 3 through 5. And again, some of these are going to be repeating. So just, I'd ask for your patience, but just to listen to the words because they are important. And it's a beginning point because we're going to delve into this a little bit more deeply here. So Revelation 22, verses 3 through 5. And... Um, it, as we have heard before, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp or light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So how can we be assured that we'll be among those where he has his name written on our foreheads. So I guess the question is, how do we get that then? So let's take, let's take a step back and review the big picture here to understand where we're going and how that then becomes, how we get his name written on our foreheads. So in God's loving grace and mercy, he established a plan to save all of humanity, as we all know and hopefully as you know. And he establish this plan to save humanity, all of humanity, from eternal death if, it's conditional, it's a free gift if, by faith, they accept him as their Lord and creator and redeemer and what he has to offer. And this, as we know, is God's plan of salvation. And this plan existed before the creation of the earth. And you can read about this because God planned for this that if something should go wrong, he had a plan to restore us back to him. And you could read all about this in Ephesians, 2 Timothy, Titus, and Revelation. But this was first presented in the Garden of Eden right after the fall. And it was further revealed in the types and shadows of the Hebrew sanctuary service, which is described in Exodus 25. And it was given its fullest expression and fulfillment in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And as Seventh-day Adventists, we should all study and share with others God's plan of salvation. Because if, if we individually are willing to believe in him and exercise our faith in him, then he takes each of us individually through his plan of salvation as illustrated in the sanctuary process. So we're going to review this process very briefly for um, the sake of time. We're going to go through this briefly. So let's begin in the courtyard. What's the first item of the courtyard? What's the very first item? A lot of people say oh, the altar sacrifice. Not yet. It's the gate. It's the gate. Who is the gate? Jesus Christ is the gate. John 10, 7 through 9. Therefore, Jesus said again, Verily, truly, I, excuse me, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. So we make a choice at the very beginning whether we want to get to know God, whether we want to get to know Jesus. That's our choice. And so then we choose to die to our old self, and that's represented at the altar of sacrifice. Then we are symbolically cleansed of our old selves and begin a new life in Jesus, and that represents the labor. And we are justified through Jesus. Let me read John 14, 6. As Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Again, he is the gate. It all begins, it all ends with Jesus. So this process of going through the, car, of the courtyard is known as, it's referred to as justification. And you can read about that in Romans and 1 Corinthians, Galatians. You could read about that. But now let's move on to the holy place. And there are three items in the holy place. What are they? Well, the first one is the table of showbread. And that is representing the word of God. Um, that is representing the word of God so that we read his word, we eat it, we digest it so that he can speak to us so that we can get to know him. And then next item is the altar of incense, which represents our prayers ascending to God. So that's our personal relationship in talking back with God is through our prayers. And the third item is the seven-branch lampstand, and that's representing the Holy Spirit working within us to reflect the character of God to others. And this process that we go through in this compartment of the holy place, it's commonly referred to as sanctification. So what's being changed during this process? Well, God, through the Holy Spirit, is changing our hearts and our minds while strengthening our faith in him so that we can reflect his character. So now to the last compartment here, which is the most holy place, or also known as, known as the Holy of Holies. And what primary items are located here? Well, the primary items are the Ark of the Covenant. And what's contained in the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments. You have the mercy seat above them and the covering cherubs. This is where our lives, our characters, our profession of faith, what kind of faith? And our expression of love, what kind of love? For God are measured by the Ten Commandments. And keep in mind, the Ten Commandments aren't the Ten Restrictions. Those are God's, it's God's character. It represents his complete love. The first four commandments is expressing our love to God and then the, sec the last six are representing our interactions, our love for humanity. The two greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. So the Ten Commandments are God's love and we keep those commandments because we love him. Jesus tells us in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. And by his grace, the mercy seat that is sitting on top of the Ark of Covenant, the mercy seat of Jesus Christ shields us from the condemnation of the law. And by his atoning sacrifice, his shed blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness before the Father. And this is oftentimes referred to as glorification. This is God's 
plan of salvation. It's our choice by faith in Jesus and his righteousness to accept or reject his gift of salvation. By faith, we are justified, sanctified, and glorified by Jesus unto the Father. It's through Jesus Christ. This is how his name, this is how God's name is written on our foreheads. And I love the words of Isaiah. Isaiah 43, 1 assures us of this redemption. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. What a promise to claim. And in closing, I want to read these assurances that we have. Revelation 7, 1 through 4. And all after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel descending from the east. I'm sorry, ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, and the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Revelation 14.1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on the Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. The Father's name is written on our foreheads. The Father's name is the seal. That is the seal of God. He knows who we are. He claims us. You are mine. I know who you are. And then Revelation 22, 1 through 4, but I'm just going to read uh, verse 3. We've, we have read this a few times. But just three and four, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. I also like to finish with a quote from Ellen White from Manuscripts 11, 1896. And I love how she states this too. And she repeats Revelation 22, 4, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. Their minds were given to God in this world. They served him with their intellect and with their heart. And now he can put his name on their foreheads. This is what it means to have his name written on our foreheads. We have served him knowing who he is. He knows who we are. And we have given him our heart. He knows our heart. We are his so if by faith, hope, and love for God and Jesus, now, and if we don't turn away from him, his name is written right now on your foreheads, and it will be written on our foreheads in the new heavens and the new earth. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you both. Any other thoughts? All right. So I just, I just have this final thought. This has been a wonderful quarter in this lesson. And as we end this year and as we end this lesson, I think about everything that's happening in this world and how we're seeing signs more and more frequently leading to final events. And so in this final thought, I just want to leave us with this beautiful thought from The Great Controversy. It's actually, it's one of my favorite. I've read it many times. The Great Controversy has ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow all life, light, and gladness. Throughout the realms of illuminable space, from the minutest atom to the greatest world. All things, animate and inanimate, in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy, declare God is love. 
So let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, Father, we're thankful for this year, another year of life that you have given us to be with you, Father. We pray that as we go into this next year that you go before us, that we are ever mindful every day how important it is that we look to you for our strength, for our guidance, for our leadership, Lord. We pray that we will follow you wherever you go and that no matter what happens, we know that we can trust in you, that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. And so, Father, we have this hope. We have this hope of, of, of time in heaven with you where we can look and see you face to face, where we can sit at your feet and learn, where all of the pain and suffering that has gone on in this world will soon end. So we look forward to that day, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Before we leave, I just wanted to say next quarter, uh, if you haven't picked up a quarterly, please do so. Next quarter, we're going to be studying stewardship. And stewardship is an important topic, especially as we learn how to live with God. He wants us to be stewards of everything in our life. So have a wonderful, happy new year, and see you next year. Happy new happy year. Happy new year. <laughs>